Even though Cincinnati is Ohio's third largest city, it is the largest metro area in Ohio. There's plenty of things to like about Cincinnati. However, the Bengals and Reds are not one of them. In this video, I'm about to drive in mad circles around downtown Cincinnati, and I'll tell you more about it along the way. I start the video at Mount Echo Park on the city's west side, which, as you can see, has great views of downtown Cincinnati. It goes without saying that the camera doesn't do the view much justice. If you enjoy this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also make sure to hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos with amazing insights on other places like what you see here can be found in my Ohio River Cities playlist, my USA Large City Downtowns playlist, or in my Ohio playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. Mount Echo Park is located in a rougher area of Cincinnati. The surrounding neighborhoods of East Price Hill and West Price Hill have some of the highest burglary and carjacking rates in all of Cincinnati. We can dive more into the Price Hill area maybe in a future video though, as this video will mostly be about downtown Cincinnati. I'll also be going through parts of one of the largest urban historic districts in the country, which is called Over the Rhine. For this video, I tried to go through every street in downtown Cincinnati, however there were a few streets that were closed off for construction. With that said, it's going to be a pretty long video, and just like with all of my videos, I provided some timestamps down below to where you can skip ahead to the parts that you might want to see. It's an interesting drive though to get into downtown Cincy from where we are currently, and if you're all about seeing everything, then there isn't a dull moment in this video, as Cincinnati is a surprisingly interesting city. I say that it's surprisingly interesting as I feel like most people who have never been here just assume that it's in the boring flyover state of Ohio and it's just another typical Rust Belt Midwestern city. I would say in my opinion that it's easily the most interesting city in Ohio, which is a state that has quite a few larger cities, and in this video hopefully you'll be able to see why that is. So far you've been able to see that the geography of Cincinnati is pretty unique for a large Ohio city, as there are plenty of steep hills that rise from the Ohio River Valley, creating for a nice picturesque landscape surrounding downtown. As we head through here, you'll see some remnants of an old bridge that used to go over this freeway. It appears that it was a set of railroad tracks that connected the above elevated rail to some railroad tracks at ground level along the river. Based off of historical aerial photos, the railroad bridge was removed sometime in the 70s or the early 80s, and for whatever reason, the supports for the bridge still stand here today. With the steep hills that surround downtown Cincinnati along with the river, you're going to get unique infrastructure like this railroad viaduct over this roadway. Since bridges over the Ohio River need to be a certain height, and since trains can only operate on a slight percentage of incline, and since the terrain of the land elevates drastically to the north, and to avoid having too many railroad crossings which would disrupt vehicle traffic, Cincinnati has quite a few railroad and automobile viaducts on the western edge of downtown. 
called the Maringway Overpass, this was built to connect Cincinnati's Union Terminal with the CNO Bridge over the Ohio River. I feel like there's not that many people that take this way into downtown Cincinnati. Nonetheless, in case you do, here is this sign to help point you straight ahead to some of the Queen City's attractions. Not that there's any other way to go other than continuing straight on Maring Way. There is somewhere to turn here though, and we're going to turn here just because we can. As we do, you can see a string of older warehouses that line Pete Rose Way to the left. Some of them appear to still be used as warehouses while others are used for event space and at the end, there's a wine store with a nightclub on the other side behind it. Straight above is the infamous double-decker Brent Spence Bridge that carries I-75 and 71 over the Ohio River. Visible as ever are the sheets of metal along the southbound lanes to protect drivers traveling on the northbound lanes from falling pieces of concrete. As the nation continues to struggle to find funding for infrastructure, sites like this are pretty common, especially in the eastern half of the country. What makes the bridge infamous? Well, for Cincinnati being pretty far down on the list of the United States' largest metro areas, the Wikipedia page for the Brent Spence Bridge claims that it's the third most heavily traveled bridge in the country at 165,000 average daily crossings. The way the ramps are designed leading to and from the bridge on the Cincinnati side causes daily traffic jams. The travel lanes are narrow and the bridge is old, as it opened in 1963. A recent accident in November of 2020 forced the bridge to shut down for a month when two semis collided to create an explosion from the chemicals that were being hauled across. To the right ahead is Paul Brown Stadium, home of the NFL's Cincinnati Bungles, I mean, Bengals. The stadium opened in August of 2000 and was named after Paul Brown, the founder of the franchise. The stadium has a seating capacity of over 65,000. At the time of making this video, Paul Brown Stadium is one of only three NFL stadiums that are not named after a sponsored company, the other two being Lambeau Field in Green Bay and Soldier Field in Chicago. As much as I don't want to admit it, Paul Brown Stadium does sit beautifully along the Ohio River along with the nearby Great American Ballpark. Paul Brown Stadium is the only NFL stadium ever to be recognized with a National AIA Honor Award. AIA stands for the American Institute of Architects. The stadium, along with Great American Ballpark, replaced the old Riverfront Stadium, or Synergy Field, which was a multi-purpose stadium that was in use from 1970 through 2002 and was home to both the Reds and the Bengals. Now on to the next talking point, which is the Andrew J. Brady Icon Music Center. While I was here, the venue was in the final stages of construction. The music facility provides outdoor concert space along with indoor concert space to allow the building to be used year-round. The inside venue will have a seating capacity of 4,500, while the outdoor facilities will be able to fit in 8,000. If you're wondering who Andrew J. Brady is, he was a longtime Cincinnati music educator and musician. The venue is scheduled to open on July 21st, 2021 or exactly five days after I uploaded this video to YouTube. Of the buildings that you see here from left to right, you have the Inquirer Building, which is the name of Cincinnati's newspaper, the Art Deco-style Carew Tower, which is the second tallest in Cincy and has an observation deck on top, and on the right is the 4th and Vine Tower, and it goes without saying that it's located at 4th and Vine. 
When the building was built, however, it opened as the Union Central Tower and was the fifth tallest building in the world and the second tallest building outside of New York City. It might come to many people's surprise that Cincinnati for an entire generation was one of the nation's 10 largest cities all the way from 1830 to 1900, getting as high as sixth place in the 1840 U.S. Census. The fact that Cincy used to be home to the fifth tallest building in the world is a sign of those times for Cincinnati. The first shiny blue glass building on the left is the Scripps Center, which was completed in 1990 and stands 468 feet. Past that is the Great American Tower, which opened in January of 2011 at a height of 665 feet, making it Cincinnati's tallest building. I actually remember going through Cincinnati when I was a teenager while it was getting built, and you can actually see it during the construction phases right here on Google Street View. Meanwhile, on the right you have the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center which focuses on the history of slavery and is a nice museum to check out if museums are your thing. In between 2nd and 3rd streets lies the Sunken Trench urban freeway that's known as Fort Washington Way. It's only a ninth of a mile long, however the name comes from Fort Washington, which stood where downtown Cincinnati is today, before downtown Cincinnati ever existed. Fort Washington propped up on the north side of the Ohio River right here back in 1789 and was named as such after the first president of the U.S., George Washington. In 1803, the fort moved south of the river to Newport, Kentucky and was called the Newport Barracks. In 1806, the land that Fort Washington once stood on north of the river was sold off. Straight ahead you'll be able to see the Heritage Bank Center which is an indoor sports arena that was built in 1975. The original name was Riverfront Coliseum, other names that it's been known by includes the Crown, First Star Center, and US Bank Arena. The arena seats 17,500 people and is home to the Cincinnati Cyclones of the ECHL, a mid-level professional ice hockey league. This is the American Queen Paddle Wheel, and it's a nice piece of Americana along the river to symbolize the steamboat culture that the Ohio River brings along with it. Here you can see the skyline of Covington, Kentucky behind the Roebling Suspension Bridge. I wasn't able to drive across the bridge while I was here as it was closed for construction. The Roebling Suspension Bridge, however, is another structure that marks the glory years for Cincinnati when it used to be one of the 10 largest cities in the United States. When the bridge opened in 1866, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world at 1,057 feet and it's named after the designer of the bridge, John A. Roebling. Roebling also designed the Brooklyn Bridge which opened in 1883 at 1,595 feet, 17 years after this suspension bridge was built in Cincinnati. Going back a little, as directly to the right is the Great American Ballpark which is better seen from the drone footage at the beginning of this video. The ballpark opened in 2003 which went along with Paul Brown Stadium opening up in 2001 replacing the old Synergy Field. Great American Ballpark is named after the Great American Insurance Group and the stadium can seat just over 42,000 fans. To the right past the bridge is the Anderson Pavilion which provides some outdoor event space and then there's an indoor carousel ride called Carol Ann's Carousel. Last thing about this area along the riverfront before we move on is that it's called The Banks. It's obvious that the city of Cincinnati has invested a lot of money over the past decade in this district to make it a nice place for people to spend some time at. Now it's time to go on to the city's stats. 
Downtown might look pretty and the riverfront area will make you want to come visit the city, but the city stats brings the reality to the picture. It's definitely not the worst city in terms of poverty and crime rates, but Cincinnati does have its fair share of issues citywide. Over time, the Queen City is like many of the large cities found in the Midwestern United States as it's lost a large chunk of its peak population of 503,000 during the 1950 U.S. Census. Hamilton County has followed the same trend as it has lost around 100,000 of its 1970 peak population of 924,000 people. Looking at those numbers can be misleading, however, as to how the entire Cincinnati metro area is doing, as the metro area has seen continuous slight population growth since 1950. Today it's ranked as the 30th largest metro area in the U.S. as it ranks just below the Austin, Texas metro area which has been exploding in population growth. Right below Cincinnati is the Kansas City metro area which is growing at about double the rate of Cincinnati. And two spots below Cincinnati at 32 is Columbus, Ohio which has been seeing a growth rate of four times the amount of that of Cincinnati. So don't be surprised if the Columbus, Ohio metro area soon takes the reign from Cincinnati as being the largest in Ohio. Cincinnati is not the largest city in Ohio, it's Columbus. Everyone knows that, you idiot. It's not even close. You're looking at the wrong information. Yeah, I'm not the idiot here, buddy. If you listen to what I said, I said metro area, not city. At the time of uploading this video to YouTube, the Cincinnati metro area is the largest in Ohio as it's home to 2.2 million residents. Columbus, Ohio might be the larger city as it cheated by annexing the entire county that it's in, but the metro area is still behind Cincinnati as it's home to just a slightly less amount of people at 2.1 million. You'll be right about it in several years though, as the Columbus metro area will soon pass Cincinnati's. Meanwhile, you might have spotted on the left that we're passing by the Macy's building as Macy's is headquartered in Cincinnati, and ahead on the right you'll see the Kroger building as the large grocery store chain is also headquartered in Cincinnati. Finishing up the city stats, Cincinnati has a pretty low median household income at $40,000 per year. However, the percentage of adults with a bachelor's degree or higher is above the national average rates, so that's good at least. The median value of owner-occupied housing units is also pretty low at 138,000, and the poverty rates are more than double the national average rates, as it's at 26%. Citywide, Niche.com gives the Cincinnati Public Schools a B-, but the crime rates are essentially double the national average rates. The violent crime rate is 845 for every 100,000, and the property crime rates are 4,300 for every 100,000. Downtown is a pretty safe area, as you can see. However, now that we're crossing Central Parkway, we are now in a district that is known as Over the Rhine. Once you get north of Liberty Street, that part of Over the Rhine has been known as a hotspot for crime. The district has been getting better in that aspect, though, and hopefully newer developments can help continue to make the district better. You'll see me continue to head through the streets of downtown Cincinnati and Over the Rhine as I make Liberty Street the northern boundary for where I drive in this video. In future videos, I'll be able to expand and go through other parts of the city, but the reason for me going through the southern half of Over the Rhine for this video is because it's a nice compliment to downtown and it's a pretty neat historic district. You can find crime anywhere if that's all you're ever looking for. I love Cincinnati and won't take any visitor bashing my city. Oh come on now, I've done nothing but say glowing things about Cincinnati for 80% of this video so far. Also that's a false statement, as the violent crime rates in Cincinnati are nearly three times the national average rates. You folks in Cincinnati need to put the guns down, seriously. I'm basing all of these numbers off of 2019, as the pandemic brought an extreme rise in crime everywhere, so I don't think it's fair to base numbers off of that, unless the extreme rise in violent crime continues everywhere for years to come, but that's yet to be seen. However, in 2019, Cincinnati saw 73 homicides. There are thousands of cities in the United States that go entire years without homicides. So don't tell me that you can find crime anywhere if that's all you're ever looking for. That's like trying to dismiss the issue that your city has a crime problem. It's okay though, you're not alone, and I wouldn't put Cincinnati in the category of Baltimore, Detroit, or Chicago. So it's okay, calm down. Once again, just to be clear and to not make all the Cincinnati slappies mad, the areas of Over the Rhine that are south of Liberty Street where we are, along with the downtown areas that we've seen, are all nice places in Cincinnati to live and to visit.
Nonetheless, let's talk about Over the Rhine and what makes it a distinctive district. Today, the district offers many places to eat, shop, and have a night out on the town. The website CincinnatiUSA.com claims that the district has some of the hottest restaurants and shops in the region, that region being southwestern Ohio, northern Kentucky, and southeastern Indiana, and it's hard to argue with that as the region outside of downtown Cincinnati, maybe Newport and Covington, Kentucky as well, is pretty dull and lacks culture to say the least. The buildings in Over the Rhine were built from the 1860s to the 1880s. Going along with what I was saying earlier, mostly everything that a tourist would want to see in Over the Rhine would be south of Liberty Street. When Cincinnati was young, there used to be a canal called the Miami and Erie Canal that runs on the same path that Central Parkway sits today. The word Rhine in the name of the neighborhood, over the Rhine, comes from what the early German settlers of this district used to call the canal. German settlers called it the Rhine after the River Rhine in Germany. Since the district is north of downtown Cincinnati and the canal separated the district from downtown, they called it over the Rhine. Meanwhile, the park to the right is Washington Park, and the building that you saw on the opposite side of the park was Music Hall, which was built in 1878 and is home to the Cincinnati Ballet, the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, the Cincinnati Opera, the Cincinnati Pops Orchestra, and the May Festival. We'll get a better look at the building later. To the right here is the Eric Kunzel Center for the Arts and Education. The building's modern architecture blends in nicely with the surrounding buildings. And as we cross Central Parkway, we're officially back in downtown Cincinnati as Central Parkway is the borderline for the Over the Rhine District. The easiest way that I've found out to discover the demographics for certain parts of these larger cities is to go by zip codes, and the zip code for downtown Cincinnati is 45202. The zip code covers all of downtown Cincinnati, all of the Over the Rhine District, and includes Mount Adams, which is where I go at the end of this video. Nonetheless, the 45202 zip code is estimated to be home to 14,250 people, down from a 2010 population of 15,483. The median household income is $69,000 per year, well over the Cincinnati average of 40,000. The percentage of adults with bachelor's degrees or higher is 65%, nearly double that of the city's average. The median value of owner-occupied housing units doesn't compare with the rest of the city or the state as it's exceptionally higher, and the poverty rate is 20%, which is pretty high, but not as high when you take the data from the entire city of Cincinnati. I will also add that the median age of this zip code's residents is 33.8 years. I think it's safe to say that the demographic makeup of this zip code is a diverse group of young professionals who are single or couples who have not yet started their families. Going back to some history as I keep passing by interesting places and I haven't had much time to talk about the history yet, Cincinnati was settled in 1788, incorporated as a town on January 1st, 1802, and as a city on March 1st, 1819. The name Cincinnati comes from two things. One of those things is pretty simple, as it's in recognition of the Roman citizen soldier Cincinnatus. The second of those things is pretty complicated, as it's based on the Society of Cincinnati, which is a fraternal hereditary society with 13 constituent societies in the United States and one in France. If I lost you, don't worry, because I lost myself when reading that. The society was founded in 1783 to perpetuate the, quote, remembrance of this vast event, end quote, which is supposed to be the achievement of American independence. The society still runs today and is the oldest patriotic hereditary society in America. If that sounded like I read it straight off of Wikipedia, that's because I did. 
Anyway, before the place was named Cincinnati in 1790, the settlement was called Losentiville and contained only three log cabins. Earlier I mentioned how there used to be a fort here called Fort Washington, and that is what essentially brought settlers to Cincinnati. Settlers made their fortunes by providing Ohio River sailors and nearby soldiers with supplies. By 1792, four years after having only three log cabins, Cincinnati had 30 warehouses to supply the local soldiers and the Ohio River sailors. In the early 1800s, Cincinnati became a hub for meat packing. Some would refer to Cincinnati as Porkopolis, as pork processing in particular became huge here. Cincinnati was an ideal location for all of that activity for the lone fact that it was located off of the Ohio River, which provided the fastest and best means of transportation back then via boat. From there on, Cincinnati continued to grow. To the left here is the mostly vacant Terrace Plaza Hotel which was built in the late 1940s. It's a mixed-use building and there used to be two department stores on the bottom floors with the hotel part of the building on top of the stores. Above the hotel was a five-star restaurant and the eighth floor was used for various things including ice skating in the winter. The hotel closed in 2008, but the building was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2017. In 2020, the National Trust for Historic Preservation named it as one of America's most endangered historic places as the future of the building at this point is largely unknown. Straight above is the skywalk for the now vacant Millennium Hotel. It just so happened that while I drove through here, the skywalk was on schedule to be demolished the following week. The reason that I was unable to drive the full length of Elm Street while I was here was for the demolition of the 34-story Millennium Hotel. The building on the north side of 6th Street is also being demolished. The Millennium Hotel began demolition in March of 2021, just weeks prior to me driving through here. It was Cincinnati's largest hotel with 872 rooms. It's expected to take all the way through at least the spring of 2022 to complete the process. The hotel was incredibly short-lived as it opened in 2004 and closed on New Year's Eve of 2019, right before the pandemic hit. Ahead on the right is another view of the Eric Kunzel Center for Arts and Education, and since we cross Central Parkway, we are back in the Over the Rhine neighborhood. To the left here is a different view of the Music Hall, which once again was built in 1878. Here is a good example of how Liberty Street divides the good parts of the Over the Rhine neighborhood and the not so good parts. As you look across Liberty Street, you can see several buildings with graffiti and you can easily see that the buildings have not been as well kept up with. Not all of Over the Rhine north of Liberty Street looks like this, but a lot of it does. To see that neighborhood and the rest of Cincinnati, I'll be coming back eventually to make more videos.
On the right, you can see the newly opened TQL Stadium, which is home of FC Cincinnati, a part of Major League Soccer. The stadium is built specifically for soccer and took around two and a half years to build. The stadium is capable of holding up to 26,000 fans. We're also on the north and south portion of Central Parkway. This portion of the road separates the West End neighborhood with Over the Rhine. Up ahead, Central Parkway takes a 90 degree turn to the left. To the right here, you have a pair of museums, one being the Lloyd Library and Museum and the other being the Cincinnati Fire Museum. To the right here is the Cincinnati City Hall, which opened in 1893. The building material consisted of stone from quarries from Ohio, Wisconsin, Missouri, and Indiana. We passed by this earlier, but I was talking about other things. Straight ahead is the Duke Energy Convention Center, which provides event space for downtown Cincinnati. It used to be connected to the Millennium Hotel via a network of skywalks, but you heard the story of that building earlier in the video. The Duke Energy Convention Center gets its name from the nearby regional power supply company known as Duke Energy. The convention center opened in 1967 and had expansions done in 1984 and in 2006. This is Central Avenue, which is a major street on the western edge of downtown, and it's not to be confused with the other main route that I've been on previously, Central Parkway. Whoever thought that it was a good idea to name two major streets close by in a downtown area with the same name didn't think that one through very carefully. Currently, we're in the West End neighborhood, which in the 1950s, most of it was demolished for an urban renewal project. There are still some historic buildings here and there, but it's clear just by looking around that it's not as dense as the Over the Rhine neighborhood, largely in part to the urban renewal project that took place in the 1950s. Historically, this section of town was where the free slaves settled when the town was young. Manufacturing jobs were plenty in Cincinnati at the time and provided hope for black people back then. Throughout the 19th century, several race riots took place in this part of town, and going back to what I said earlier, in the 1950s, the city decided to use the West End for several urban renewal projects. I-75 also ripped through this part of town. Today you can see that there are several newer looking townhomes that surround the southern part of the West End. And here is another view of the new TQL Stadium. To the right is Taft High School, and in order for the new Major League Soccer Stadium to get built, they had to swap land with the school's football field. The rebuilt field is here to the left, and it's called Stargell Stadium. The name comes from a coach who was with the school in the 1950s and 60s. Next, I head towards Cincinnati's Union Terminal.
and soon we'll be at one of Cincinnati's most famed landmarks, if not the most famed landmark, and that is the Cincinnati Union Terminal. The building was opened in March of 1933 and closed in October of 1972. The building was not used as a train station again until July of 1991 when Amtrak began using it. Starting from the beginning in 1933, the train station served seven different railroad lines and replaced other outdated train stations in Cincinnati at the time. The rise of the automobile and the airline industries killed the use of the Union Terminal as less people rode trains for long-distance travel, forcing the Union Terminal to close for its original purpose as a train station in 1972. For a while, after the building stopped being used as a train station, most of the building's space was being unused and the owner of the building mentioned that he planned on demolishing it. Activists pushed for the building to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places, but the building was not yet 50 years old in the early 1970s. 70s. Train companies demolished the old concourse, but the main building was safe. Shortly after, the passenger yard became a freight yard for trains. Some more on the timeline of the building, as there's a lot to it. In 1977, the building was listed as a National Historic Landmark. In 1978, a shopping mall opened inside called the Land of Oz. The mall had 54 vendors at its peak and saw 8,000 visitors a day. By 1981, however, the tenant count dropped to 21. In August of 1981, the Cincinnati Museum of Health, Science, and Industry opened in the terminal. In 1984, the Land of Oz shopping mall closed. In 1986, the Union Terminal Association was born to help the long-term preservation of the building. In 1990, the entire building opened as museum space even though a small portion of it was already being used for museum space. The museums inside included the Cincinnati Historical Society Library, the Cincinnati History Museum, the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History, and the Robert D. Lindner Family Omnimax Theater. Shortly after, in 1991, Amtrak brought back service to the Union Terminal as the space became usable again. In the 2000s, discussions for renovations took place throughout the entire decade essentially. Shortly after, in 1991, Amtrak brought back service to the Union Terminal as the space became usable again from all of the recent renovations for the new museums. In the 2000s, discussions for renovations took place throughout the entire decade essentially. In 2014, the building was listed as one of the 11 most endangered historic places in the country as the building was massively deteriorating. From July 2016 to November 2018, the building was shut down for a $228 million renovation project through the entire building. It was the first full renovation of the Union Terminal since being constructed in 1933. Now that is what I like to call serious dedication to a historic landmark, people. Good job, Cincinnati. Now we're back in the heart of the West End neighborhood as we check out some more streets through downtown Cincinnati that we haven't yet been on. By the way, if you haven't already, make sure to drop a like for all of the amazing insight that you've heard on this video so far. You know it's amazing. Don't lie. I pointed this out earlier, but now we get a better view of it, and to the right is the Cincinnati Fire Museum.
We've crossed this east and west stretch of Central Parkway several times at this point, but we haven't yet driven the stretch. I mentioned way earlier how this stretch of Central Parkway lies along the path of where the Miami and Erie Canal used to be. This area had a large influence of German settlers early on, and the canal was given the nickname of Rhine based off of the River Rhine in Germany. Over the Rhine is to the left and downtown is to the right. The canal stretched all the way from Toledo to Cincinnati. Once the canal became unused, city planners built Central Parkway on top of the old Miami and Erie Canal, leaving space below for what was supposed to be Cincinnati's subway system. There's a network of incomplete tunnels below downtown and over the Rhine for what is the largest abandoned subway system in the United States. The abandoned tunnels are only a couple of miles long when you combine them, but it's a cool fact nonetheless. Construction for the subway system began in 1928 to replace the streetcar system, but the Great Depression made it difficult to continue funding the project, so now it's just lying below the streets of downtown Cincinnati unfinished and forgotten. Today, there's a 52-inch water main inside parts of the tunnel, along with an optical fiber cable. Officials in 2008 estimated that it would cost $100 million to revive the tunnels to be used as a subway. Anyway, this is yet another nice street in over the Rhine with plenty of shopping and dining options. To the right is the Woodward Theater, which originally opened in 1913, closed during the Great Depression, and reopened in 2014. Something that I haven't yet mentioned would be the top employers in the Cincinnati metro area today. Those include the Cincinnati Children's Hospital with 15,000 workers, Kroger with 15,000 workers, the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport with over 14,000 workers, Tri-Health with 12,000 workers, and the University of Cincinnati Health with 11,000 workers. Three of the top five are hospitals. Other major employers are the University of Cincinnati with 10,000 workers, along with Procter & Gamble, which also has 10,000 employees. I've mentioned some of these before, but downtown Cincinnati is home to the headquarters of six different Fortune 500 companies. Earlier you could see the giant Macy's and Kroger logos on top of their respective buildings. Others include Procter & Gamble, Fifth Third Bank, American Financial Group, and the Western and Southern Financial Group. And once again, we cross Central Parkway, which means that we have left over the Rhine. One thing that I haven't yet talked about is the food that Cincinnati is famous for. Cincinnati is known for its own skyline chili. Chili started to become a thing in Cincinnati in the 1920s, as the city had a large presence of Greek immigrants. In 2013, the Smithsonian named Cincinnati-style chili as one of the 20 most iconic foods in America. The chili is made of Greek pasta with spiced meat and hot dog topping sauce, among other ingredients. Cincinnati-style chili has a lot of close ties to Coney Island hot dogs that are culturally significant in other parts of the United States, as the same Greek-influenced restaurants in Cincinnati early on were known for those as well. 
In the early 20th century, a restaurant known as Impress became a large chain through selling chili, and it was the largest chili selling chain in the region until 1949 with a dozen stores, but at that time that's when Skyline Chili was formed. Today, Skyline Chili has over 100 locations, mostly in Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. The closer you get to Cincinnati, the more Skyline Chili locations you'll see. In Indiana, there's a location as far north as Fort Wayne, and there are several as far west as Indianapolis. In Kentucky, Kentucky, you have several in the Louisville area and a few in Lexington. In Ohio, they go as far northeast as Cleveland, and for whatever reason, there are five Skyline Chili locations that are just randomly in Florida. Other chains exist in the Cincinnati region, such as Gold Star and Dixie Chili in Delhi. Despite the heritage of Cincinnati Chili beginning with Impress, there is only one Impress restaurant left, which is in Alexandria, Kentucky, not in downtown Cincinnati. But there's also a dozen of other individual chili restaurants throughout the area, and if you're in the Cincinnati area, you're never too far away from any of these chili restaurants. Some other things that you might not know about Cincinnati includes that it has the largest Oktoberfest in America. The annual festival sees around 500,000 visitors and is held between Walnut and Elm Streets. This comes from the large German heritage that the region has, which I've talked about throughout this video. Jerry Springer was also born in Cincinnati, and he was even the mayor of town in 1977. Everything about him and the Jerry Springer show should make sense to you now with all of the Kentucky weirdos nearby, although I would argue that southwestern Ohio and southeastern Indiana compete with Kentucky pretty well in that matter. I also haven't mentioned yet that the Cincinnati Reds are the oldest Major League Baseball team. They were founded as the Red Stockings in 1869 and As we turn the corner here, you can see the Hamilton County Courthouse, which opened in 1950 and quite frankly isn't much to look at. Driving down Sycamore provides for a nice view of Cincinnati's tallest building in the distance. Since I ended up driving on streets that I've already been on for this video for the next three to four minutes, I went ahead and skipped to a part where we have not yet been.
The twin buildings that you see on the left are home to the headquarters of Procter & Gamble. this beat in my dream. Now, since we have essentially seen all of downtown Cincinnati, it's time to head towards Mount Adams, which is known to be one of the nicest districts in all of Cincinnati. It's not at all a bad view of the Ohio River on this drive. As we begin the incline along the appropriately named Hill Street, Mount Adams was settled early in 1831 by one of America's richest men at the time, Nicholas Longworth. Longworth was an attorney who purchased a mansion on Mount Adams and decided that he wanted to make a vineyard. Longworth became known as the first person to successfully sell wine in the United States of America commercially with his Mount Adams vineyard. His vineyard was known as the Garden of Eden and today it's known as Eden Park. You'll get to see Eden Park at the very end of this video. In the 1880s, the Cincinnati Art Museum and the Cincinnati School of Arts opened in Eden Park. With the arts culture and the views that Mount Adams provides, this neighborhood has always been a wealthy one, even today. Currently around 1,600 residents call Mount Adams home. In the late 19th century, a railroad incline was built from Mount Adams down below to connect it with downtown Cincinnati and to make travel easier. The incline helped more homes get built in the neighborhood, and most of the original homes were built from 1880 to around 1910.
And this is the famed Cincinnati Art Museum. The original building opened in 1886 as the first purpose-built art museum in the United States, west of the Allegheny Mountains. The museum today features over 67,000 pieces of artwork that spans over 6,000 years of human history. As you can see, it even has a few sculptures right outside of it. The art museum sees over 300,000 visitors annually. Tickets cost $10 for people who are 18 and older, $5 for kids, 6 through 17, $5 for college students with valid IDs, $5 for seniors, and it's free for kids under 5 years old. It's also free for everyone on Thursdays from 5 to 8 p.m. Inside you can find artwork that dates all the way back to St. Christopher from 1433 to 1494. In 2019, before the pandemic hit, the Cincinnati Art Museum saw a record attendance of 346,000 visitors. During that year, the exhibition titled as No Spectators, The Art of the Burning Man, was the most highly attended exhibition since 1982. Other parts of Eden Park are to the right, which includes a pavilion, mirror lake, and an open green space. I really wanted to fly a drone here, but there are laws in Hamilton County, Ohio, where you cannot fly drones at Hamilton County Parks, and I wasn't sure if Eden Park contributed towards that, and I also wasn't sure if local law enforcement would have been sure of that, so I didn't want to risk it. In this video, you saw what makes Cincinnati a unique city, especially for the standards of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Out of those three states, it's definitely the most unique and special city when it comes to urban vibes, history, and culture. At least it is in my opinion. Sure, Cincinnati has plenty of things wrong with it too, but like I've referenced, we can get into all of that in a future video. Nonetheless, I do end the video here. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also, make sure to hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, then you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos with amazing insights on other places like what you saw here can be found in my Ohio playlist, my Ohio River Cities playlist, or in my USA Large Cities Downtowns playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. We'll see you next time. Peace!